Hello there, this is Robin Norgren, and you are at the Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life podcast. Thanks so much for stopping by. Today I'd like to start um, with Lamentations 3, 25 to 33. It is from the New Living Translation and some thoughts by Eugene Peterson. God proves to be good to the man who passionately waits, to the woman who diligently seeks. It's a good thing to quietly hope, quietly hope for help from God. It's a good thing when you're young to stick it out through the hard times. When life is heavy and hard to take, go off by yourself, enter the silence, bow in prayer, don't ask questions, wait for hope to appear. Don't run from trouble, take it full face. The quote, worst, unquote, is never the worst. Why? Because the master won't ever walk out and fail to return. If he works severely, he also works tenderly. His stockpiles of loyal love are immense. He takes no pleasure in making life hard, in throwing roadblocks in the way. Think about this. The man who passionately waits and the woman who diligently seeks are not representing different actions for different genders, but rather representing poetic parallels of one another. Hoping and waiting often go together, but somehow waiting can feel suspiciously passive to us. Why should we wait on God in hard times? What attitude should we maintain while waiting? Thank God for his unchanging and unfailing love. He is the master who never fails to return. He takes no delight in making life difficult. Praise Christ for coming to experience sorrow alongside you and for taking on your burdens firsthand. Ask for the patience and strength to wait in hope. Express your worries and broken heart directly to him and pray for endurance and certainty in God's purposes. God is the master who won't fail to return. What other phrases can you come up with that describe God's faithfulness even in the midst of our fears? T.D. Jakes in his book, Crushing, writes, But what about the toxicity of, which we re- of what we release? The negativity we carry in our hearts that can be so ugly, so adverse, and contrary to what God has called us to be. If these dregs are not dealt with in short order, they easily become communicable and spread throughout the nearby population like an unstoppable poison. Perhaps then, this is why the master venter allows our fermentation to take place outside the view, influence, and input of others. For if people get too close to us during the process of casting off everything we failed to release over the years, those same people can easily be rendered spiritually unconscious, never wanting to have anything to do with us or the venter we wish to emulate. I cannot properly express to you my gratitude for the Lord having the wisdom to relocate me to private places, hiding me within his wings as he went to work on my character. I've learned the hard way that many people cannot handle the ugly parts of me. If you're honest with yourself, I gather you would arrive at the same conclusion about yourself. As a matter of fact, I'll bet that you've caught glimpses of how black-hearted your heart can be 
and were completely caught off guard and left thinking, I had no clue I could be that rude. This is because transition isn't easy. During times of change, upheaval, and transition, you become moody, unstable, emotionally irregular, and sometimes even contemptible. I know I can become all of those and more. This is why you have to be careful with people while they're changing. You have to be mature and ready for whatever comes. Because when the truth is told, you never know what you're going to get. So be cautious with how you handle someone who's in the midst of change, including yourself. As God works within us, we all throw off nauseous material. We are being refined for a greater purpose than anyone can imagine or understand. Instead of despairing or fearing God's absence, we must appreciate the grace the vinter is showing us when he hides us in the inner court during our fermenting times. Those times when all things dead are in the tomb while the transition occurs. We all experience seasons that are like the second day, waiting, wondering, waiting some more. It's not just so that someone else won't get hurt while you're being transformed. It's also that you won't be corrupted. How pitiful it would be for the master venter to return to the vats and see the vintage he knew he would he knew would be the best he has ever produced actually be worse than vinegar because something soured during the fermentation period or what if he released you too soon whatever it is the master has placed on your heart to do for him i would suggest that he has or will take you through a season of hiding you it's there that he gets you ready for your assignment and you won't be the first Joseph was hidden in the pit and in prisons. Moses was hidden in the desert for 40 years. David was hidden in the pastures while tending sheep. Jesus was hidden in Egypt as a child long before he endured his time in the tomb. Each of them was locked away and tended only by the master venter, lest someone came along and disrupt their maturation process on the way to becoming wine. I thank God for hiding me and releasing me when he was ready instead of when I was still fermenting. No matter how ready I thought I was to preach and move into the next level of my ministry, the Lord knew the time I needed to ferment and mature. His time rarely seems to match our own impatience, but we must learn to release our haste in order to experience the taste. Too many of us rush to get to the end of the process, trying to tell God that we are ready for what he has for us, when we're not even fully understanding the gift that we have. Or we would be waiting and rehearsing when our time comes for the spotlight to shine on us as life's curtain goes up. His timing may not reflect our expectations, but during fermentation, we must practice patience trust his perfect knowledge of the time required for us to reach maximum potency and flavor. The master venter knows when your wine is ready. He knows when your fermentation is done. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Saved by a Poem by Kim Rawson. 
I grew up in a time in America when the act of speaking poems aloud was latent, if not extinct. My friend Judith, on the other hand, tells of a girl in Hungary in the 1930s where to pass the time as they waited for the bus, she and her friends would recite the work of the contemporary Hungarian poets to each other. She says, I would go home each night and pick a few poems to learn for the kids at the bus stop. Everybody did. It was like a game. And besides, there was this feeling of impending war everywhere. Any material possession could be taken in a moment. The only things you knew you could hold on to were what you had inside you. In many other countries as well, poetry holds a central place in the culture. The most popular primetime show in the Middle East is The Millions Poet. Boasting an audience of over 70 million viewers and ratings higher than sports or the news. Within a format similar to American Idol, poets from throughout the Gulf region, many from very poor tribes, perform poems on all themes imaginable. As one journalist reporting on the show put it, it is as common today as it was centuries ago to recite on the topics close to one's heart as well as what is affecting people around them. The show has even inspired a TV channel completely dedicated to poetry. Speaking poetry in these countries is not relegated to the poets. People who never dreamed of writing poetry carry their favorite poems in their hearts and often speak them aloud. In many parts of Latin America, Ireland, and the Middle East, for instance, it is not unusual for spoken poetry to be heard as part of everyday conversation. Poems are spoken at parties, at the family dinner table, on the street. My students from Wales and Ireland describe how the poems of Dylan Thomas or William Butler Yeats are exchanged into the night at almost any local pub. My Iranian friend's father knows many poems by Rumi and Hafiz. He knows them in Farsi, but if you give him time, he'll recite a dozen or more, then figure out the translations for you. An Israeli friend tells me poets are regarded there as national heroes. Readers line up in the bookstores of Tel Aviv for a newly released collection of poetry, with the eagerness Americans reserve for best-selling novels. In Havana, lines from the Spanish poet Antonio Marcado are emblazoned in spray paint on the sides of houses. Almost every time I find myself on a plane next to someone from outside the U.S., I am gifted with a recitation of at least one of the poems he or she holds most precious. I still have the page in my diary where a Pakistani accountant wrote, first in Urdu, then underneath in stumbling English, the poem that had won the heart of his wife 45 years earlier. I hope to dig that journal out of storage one day. Thanks so much for stopping by. You can find me on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. Thank you.